You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, and thanking you for joining us on a very special French Viva la France, c'est si bon show. I am Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And I am very pleased and honored to have the winner of the, our silent auction wine bag and gift basket uh, from the October WHCTV Gala, Essie Liber, on our show tonight, tasting with us and giving us her opinions on what we'll be tasting, which is all French tonight. And uh, Jim is responsible for a lot of the wine, actually all the wines tonight, and he's going to be filling us in on the Alsace region of France. I thought this would be the perfect time. Mm -hmm. uh, introduce us to some great wines for the summertime. Uh, these are wines you can keep cool, uh, drink out on the back porch, and get them in a nice bucket of ice. And we haven't really focused too much on the French area in particular on this show. I thought it was time we, we did that. So Yeah, we don't screw around on two guys. You can see we have the berets going. <laughs> as he matches us a little bit with her jacket. So we will be rocking the Alsace region tonight. So, Jim, I'm looking forward to these tastings. All right. Well, everything we're going to have tonight is from the Wilm Family Vineyard. Uh, this is in Alsace, which is the northeast corner of France. Uh, it's right on the border of Germany and Switzerland. And if, if you think about the territory, it has changed hands between this, the French and the Germans multiple times throughout history, uh, four times in 75 years in the, the 19th and 20th century. So there's a very strong German influence in this area. Uh, you, you listen to the way the Alsatians speak French, they speak it with a German accent. You look at the architecture, it's got a very strong German influence. The food is, is half German, half French. And the wines are strongly influenced by the Germans too. And we're going to taste several tonight, uh, several varieties that you normally would think of as coming from Germany, but they actually grow them in Alsace as well. Well, that's what's fascinating to me because that region of France, because it's so close to Germany, Switzerland, you have a cooler, drier climate. So that's definitely going to be noticeable with the grapes that we'll be tasting tonight too. Yeah, these are different grape varietals than what you'll find in other regions of France. So this is, this is going to be a fascinating tasting we're going to do tonight. Well, I know Essie's dying to get in here and get some <laughs> comments, and we're going to do it a bubble first, Jim. What yes. do we have first? Yes, and tonight? Essie, well, you love the bubbles, right? Yes, I love the bubbles. All right, we're going to start off. Uh, this is a blend of four different grape varietals, and it's the, actually the other four varietals that we're going to drink tonight. Uh, so this has 30% Pinot Blanc, 30% Pinot Gris, 30% Riesling, and 10% Gewurztraminer. I didn't realize there was Riesling in there. Yes. Fascinating. Fascinating. And a lot of it. Mm-hmm. That doesn't go for everybody, but let's see if it goes for us tonight. Well, you've had it, so. Go ahead and, and try this and, and let me know what you think. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Smooth, mellow, not overly sweet, what you would expect from, obviously, a, a brute. I believe that is a brute anyways. It's it? a, yeah, it's a brute. It's also a Blanc de Blanc, which means it's white uh, juice from white grapes. And it's, yeah, it's a very round experience. Uh, it's not, you don't get any yeasty characteristic with this. Um, you get some fruit. You don't get a harsh, bitter aftertaste with this. And I know, Essie, you like sparkling. How would you rate that compared to some of the other ones you've had? This is a nine for me. But I also would consider putting in a little bit of a liqueur, maybe a blood orange or a limoncello. Oh, you're one of those. Mm, okay. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> My daughter's getting married, so we're having a, a bridal brunch, and this looks like it this would be perfect for it and it's fun. very affordable you'll, you'll mm -hmm. find this in stores for uh, anywhere between 12 and 15 dollars fantastic mm -hmm. price it was i actually have had this before okay at the price level that is for the taste there it's really good i think you wouldn't be disappointed especially if you do tend to like french sparkling compared to american sparkling or other sparkling this is spot on yeah and it was rated 88 points by the wine spectator so it's it's got great ratings from the professionals 
They see what you got yourself into on oh, this show. You're going to be really treated to some delicious mm -hmm. wine. I just have a feeling. I have not had anything coming up after the bubble. So I'm just like you, Elsie. I'm going to be really excited or disappointed. I think Jim never disappoints, though. So we're okay. I always try and breathe the good stuff. So. Yeah, I know. I've gotten reamed a few times because of my choices, but that's another time. Well, next up, we're going to try the Pinot Blanc. So if you want to go ahead and pour that, yes. Bob. Uh, Pinot Blanc is actually the same grape as Pinot Noir. It's the genetically identical. It's just when you look at it growing on the vine, it's a white color on the skin instead of a red color. Uh, but otherwise, it's identical to Pinot Noir. And Essie, are you a big fan of drinking wine for breakfast? No. Well, <laughs> brunch, yes. You should, okay. Brunch, and yes. you know what? I've yes, had yes, people yes. say that in the past. Mm -hmm. I, I try selling this as a breakfast wine. Healthy because it goes, food. It goes so well with eggs. Uh, it goes well okay. great with omelets or quiche. Mm. Um, so I, I'm always telling people, this is a great breakfast mm. wine. And I get corrected just like you did. Brunch. Everyone says brunch. Mm -hmm. So this is a good brunch mm -hmm. wine. Uh, go ahead and, th when you, when you drink, drink this, go ahead and think of eggs. Certainly no bouquet there. Not much anyways. Yeah, that's the kind of wine that um, I can see going with a breakfast meal, eggs, bacon, um, that type of food pairing. Mm -hmm. But I, I like it just as it is. I think it's very refreshing. I, I would drink it on its own, too. Just another, yeah, another great example of a, a great wine to have out on the back porch in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Have you had experience with this varietal before? No. No. Isn't it good? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> that's what's great about the show, because you always, uh, when we have people on that haven't tried a particular varietal, um, I like seeing people's terrace. reaction. Yes, sitting on the terrace after work and having a glass. Great. Maybe two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I, I think, Jim, I don't know, you probably know this in your research, but I think 25% of wine from the Alsace region is exported. Well, it's, it's funny you brought that up because the, the Wilm family was actually the first Alsatian vineyard to export wine to the United States after Prohibition was lifted in the 30s. So I, I didn't know it was, they're, they're sending 25% over now. But. Well, I have another trivia for you. Okay. Maybe you too, that's you can want to join in. United States is not the top receiver of that wine. It's number five. Do you know the three top four um, exporters or the people that get the wine from the Alsace region? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say China's in there somewhere. Australia. It is not. Australia. Belgium is number Ooh. one. Wow. Huh. Netherlands is number two. Germany is number three. Denmark is number Ooh. four. And the United States is number five. I think I know why, because I think the United States palate still isn't geared, I think, mm -hmm. towards French wine in yeah. particular. Um, but um, I was very surprised by that statistic. I, could, I can understand why the Germans are importing a lot of this, because it's, these are the same varietals that they're drinking. It's the, you know, the Rieslings and the Gewurztraminers. That's what they're used to having in Germany. So yeah. I, that, that doesn't surprise me. Um, the, the Belgian and the Netherlands, is a, it's a little bit of a surprise. And, you know, it's May that you're watching this show, I think this type of wine probably would go good with cheese too, I believe, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's mild enough where it's not going to overpower. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm going to take a little piece of cheese and try that myself. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, the bottles. Are the bottles regulation that's, in that Yeah, that's, area? that's from that area. Uh, you have to have a, a bottle that, that looks just like mm -hmm. these. So. And it makes it easier when you're shopping. You know, you see the bottle in the store, you know, mm -hmm. okay, that's, that's from Alsace. That's interesting. Hmm. And the other odd thing about Alsace is it, it's the only region in France where they actually put the grape varietal on the bottle. Usually, if you're buying a French wine, you know, you go to buy a Burgundy, you know in your head that that's a Pinot Noir, but it doesn't say Pinot Noir on the bottle, uh, unless it's from Alsace, in, in which case it'll say Pinot Gris or Pinot Blanc, Riesling. And that's, that's the exception for most French wines. It's just that region that does that, I believe, correct? Yeah. Yeah, everything else has got it, you know, it's got uh, the region on Burgundy, Rhone, Bordeaux, and just so you know, I think when you look for Alsace wines in your local stores, I think 90% of the wine from that region is white. I think uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's high, as high as that. So most yeah. of the wine you get from that region is going to be white with about 10% being, I think you said, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir. That's about the only other grape that can grow there. Yeah. So that, that's interesting also. I didn't get a lot of minerals on this, which I was expecting. No. Fresh, which is good. No, it's a lot of fruit. But I, I definitely enjoyed that. I like it. It's not too sweet. It's fruity, but not too sweet. Mm -hmm. And that's... And that's a, that's a good distinction to make because a lot of Americans, when I describe wines as being fruity, they automatically assume mm -hmm. it's going to be sweet. And those two don't go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. What do you have to say about the next one? All right, next up is Pinot Gris. Uh, and gris actually means gray in French. So when you look at the Pinot Gris grapes growing on the vine, they actually do have kind of a gray color to them. Uh, and the, the Pinot, 
I found out is uh, in reference to uh, pine cone. Pinot means pine cone in French. So when you see grapes growing in a cluster, they're kind of pine cone shaped. They have a they typically have a Pinot name. So it's you know Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris. Those are all grape clusters that grow in that that kind of pine cone shape on the on the vine. I did not know that. Interesting little tidbit. Our Johnny you. Carson <laughs> moment for the evening. I did not know that. That's very interesting. I actually always wondered where that name came from. I'm surprised I didn't know that for all the years I've been doing this uh, this show and drinking wine. Thank you, Jim. Every show, interesting little tidbit for you. Now, so, I, I meant to ask you the first two. I don't know if you know what they are. I can't really read them from here. The alcohol content, does it change much from the spark? I know what generally sparkling is, but are we going to see an increase in alcohol content as we move up the line here? I don't think so. I think these are all going to be right around the same. I, I didn't check that either. Actually, I can see 12, it as a 12, 12 and 12. And this one we're drinking right now is 12.5, so you get yep. a little bit more in the Pinot mm -hmm. Gris as compared mm -hmm. to the Pinot Blanc. What do you think, Essie? This is a little drier than the previous one. This was my favorite less, of the group. Less fruity, but it's a yeah. very nice. Yeah, it's less fruit, but it's, it fills the mouth a little better. I, I think it's a rounder wine, a little more balanced. It is, I, I, see, I don't know if you noticed this, I found, unlike the first one, which I still liked a lot, this one hits you a few seconds afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it hits your palate, it hits your tongue, it's smooth, it's gentle, but then like a, in a second or so, you sort of feel it on the corners of your mouth, which is pretty interesting. I like that. Yeah, it makes it a little more complex. It does mm -hmm. make it a little bit more complex, which some people don't think you're going to get with a white wine, but you do get a lot of complexity sometimes with other than Chardonnays with a white wine, and I think this is a good example. A little more acidity maybe on this mm -hmm. one? Yep. I like it though. I think between the two, I would pick this one. <laughs> now that's something, you bring up acidity, that's something new winemakers are starting to promote, uh, sometimes on the bottle, usually on their website, uh, but they're starting to list the pH balance of the wine. Mm. Uh, consumers mm -hmm. are starting to get more and more interested in that. And Bob and I did a show on, on acidity about a year ago now. Uh, where we talked about pH balance in the wines and how some wines are, have almost uh, no acidity to them and some have a whole lot of acidity. Uh, winemakers are really starting to clue into that now uh, that you know, consumers want to know, you know mm -hmm. how much acidity is in this wine mm -hmm. before trying it. And so they're, you know, they're publishing that information now, whereas it used to be you just, you just had to know what bottle was going to have a lot of acidity or a mm -hmm. little bit of acidity. And uh, Essie, I know you've been to France, and Jim actually is going to France in a couple weeks. Uh, so this is sort of like a little teaser for, for all of us to sort of, you know, appreciate Jim's going to France trip. But um, I, I'm expecting some great stories when you come back. I know you're going to be doing, you're going to have to squeeze a lot in, but... There will uh, be some vineyard tours. Do you uh, speak the language? I, I, je parle un peu de français. No! <laughs> so I should be able to get by. Okay, good. That's very exciting, but uh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> we want to go. <laughs> if I bring something back, you'll love me, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I've never been to France. I've, I've been to quite a few European countries. I've been to Germany, Austria, Hungary, a lot of that area of the region. But I've never been to France mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. You know, I, at the time, I sort of was anti-French. I thought they were kind of mean and snobby. But now I sort of am the same way. So, you know, I probably should go to, <laughs> go to, go to France and enjoy it a little bit. You but, become uh, grouchy in your old age? I, yeah, that's probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the French really get a bad rep. I think uh, if you go over there and you try to speak French uh, initially, instead of demanding yeah. that they speak English, they are much more receptive and much more friendly to you. They want you to sort of assimilate to them. D they do. Which they I, do. Sort of, I mean, their culture is so old, I think that's, that's a fair tribute. I really yeah. do. And there's a lot to be, uh, to be appreciative, for, appreciative of when you're there. So. Now, the, the difference is when you go to Alsace, they, don't, they are supposedly are not as snobby as the rest of France. So you don't have to go over there and, and try the German. and speak. Yeah, that could be the German in them coming out. Um, but that's, uh, that's just an interesting contrast, you know, how that little teeny sliver of the country has a complete different culture uh, and a different expectation when, when dealing with tourists. Well, I've got to say the first three um, have been thumbs up so far. Would you agree, yes? Mm hmm Absolutely. I was not disappointed at all. And I'm mm -hmm. familiar with Wilm, and I've only really had their bubbles. So my first experience going into the Pinot Blanc and the Pinot Gris I, have been very delicious, Jim. Thank you. You're welcome. And the, you know, the Wilm Estates produces over two dozen different wines, and we couldn't obviously drink all of them on the show tonight. So I, I, bought, <laughs> I brought five. We'll squeeze as many in as we can to, to have Have they ever done a marathon wine that's tasting? Right, that's right. <laughs> Jerry Lewis has done one for, you know, for a different cause, 
but maybe we could do a marathon wine tasting sometime. Just, just take a quick drink and then make a quick comment and move on. Yes, I don't know who we raise money for, just maybe mm -hmm. us. But <laughs> maybe we could squeeze into <laughs> half an I'm hour. In. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so two thumbs up. I'm very happy so far, John. All right. What do we got going now? Next up, we have Riesling. Now, people here in the United mm -hmm. States especially, people hear Riesling and they think sweet, syrupy, sticky, uh, too, uh, much too much sugar. And the true German style for Riesling and the Alsatian style is to actually make a, a dry Riesling that pairs with a lot of different foods. And we've, we've talked about Riesling a number of times on this show, and I'm trying to promote Riesling as much as possible. I love the varietal. I think it's a great wine for Thanksgiving. Uh, but you can also serve it as a dessert wine. You can serve it before the meal. Uh, and, and you can pair it with a lot of different foods during the meal. So well, We've talked about this before. There's actually three types of Riesling. Yes. So people always just assume they, they label a Riesling as just that one style. Mm -hmm. but there's a varietal of Rieslings which go from sweet to dry. Right. And uh, the names, the technical names for each one, I, I can't recall. I know the Trocken is the, the drier German style. Uh, and I, I will do a whole show on that at some point. We've talked about that in the past, too. And I... We got to get there. Well, this is actually but. our 49th show, guys. You know, well into our, our fifth year. So uh, I, our next filming will be our 50th show. So we'll do something exciting for you. But uh, I actually took a little piece of a mild cheese before I'm drinking this Riesling, which I think I probably I'm should have I'm surprised because I always thought Rieslings were sweet. This is mm -hmm. really good. And I have friends who drink Riesling, and I will definitely suggest this to them. This is. When I first tried this, I wrote lively. Now, you can actually see mm -hmm. it on my notes here. I, that was the, what jumped out at me immediately. There's so much life to this. Uh, mm -hmm. it's so, and there's, it's great acidity with this wine. Um, it's not cloying. There's no... No, not at all. Rieslings are higher in, mm -hmm. in acidity than any other varietal, and that's why a lot of them have such a high sugar content is to kind of balance out that acidity. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the really good ones, and that's my opinion when I say really good ones, but the, they they kind of tone down the sugar and, and let that acidity come through. It makes a difference. I, I, I got to say, I've been so impressed with the three whites we've tasted. I'm not going to count the bubbles because that's in a league of its own. Mm. But the, the rate, I mean, you set this up, it really is going really nice, each varietal right. moving up. Yeah, I, tr I try to go light to, not that, not that it's going to be light to heavy in terms of body or uh, color, but just in terms of the, I guess, the, the weight in your mouth. Which makes a difference. And can you see what the alcohol content is on that one? Is that... Um, 12. So that's a 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually the, uh, the Pinot Gris has been our highest alcohol content one so far. Well, and the, the Gewürztraminer is 12 and a half also. 12 and a half. Okay. So it's uh, two 12s, two 12 and a halfs. It, it, I just am mm -hmm. always... I, I like mentioning that on the show because a lot of times if you're drinking a white wine, especially in the warmer weather, like you're watching this show in May, you might drink it a little fast, mm -hmm. but just be aware that you know, there's still 12, 12 and a half percent alcohol mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, I tend to be a sipper, but uh, you know, don't chug it really fast if you're sitting on your deck. You can, but uh, as you know. Okay. <laughs> I'll listen. <laughs> but yeah, that's really nice. And actually, what are the price points? Have we, have we moved along here? These uh, are all between $12 and $15, with the exception of the Gewürztraminer. That's, that's in the probably $15 to $17 range. Uh, but these are all very, very affordable wines. And I would, uh, I would call them everyday wines if you wanted to. Actually, I, from my research with you, and I think you might can verify this, some of the most noted Rieslings in the world actually come from the Alsace region, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. People always think Germany, 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 but that's not the case necessarily because some really highly quality and expensive Rieslings come from the Alsace region. Do they tend to be more expensive also? Could you get a really expensive one? You can get a really expensive one, yeah, absolutely. I, you Have know, you I'd, tasted anything really over the $30 range for a Riesling? You know what? I've never had a really expensive Riesling, so I, I, I don't have any comparison. I'm going to guess the price point would be the size of the uh, the vinter, vineyard also, um, and the, the quantity produced. I think a lot of the probably the rieslings taste the same anyways um, when you get to a certain quality. So uh, that's a, I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. sort of deferring to you in regards to what your research showed you in regards to riesling. How do they determine the price I, point? I've got to drink more riesling to find that out. There we go. Well, that's always a, <laughs> that's always a good way to look mm -hmm. at it. It's a challenge, but someone <laughs> has to do it, right? So two th another thumbs up. So we yeah. got three thumbs up so far. That's surprisingly yeah. good, and I'm not a Riesling person. I like this. So you would yeah. buy that in the store? I would absolutely, absolutely. This makes a great... You can convert, man. I think it could be converted. <laughs> so actually, not only did you win the wine basket and have an appearance in our show, but now we are converting you, you can, to yes, Riesling. Yes, well, I, Hallelujah. With this one, yes. Well, that, that honestly was one of our ulterior motives for <laughs> doing the basket and having you on the show. Okay. 
we, we decided we're gonna whoever wins, we're gonna do a little Come wine back. education okay. for them. Mm -hmm. It's funny because the year before, the winner of our wine basket never got a chance to be on the show. They never called to be on the show. Mm -hmm. And I actually I know the person. I, I can't remember her name. And uh, she was eager. I was to be bidding on the show. against her just so oh, you, you know. were. Oh okay. yes. yes, I was bidding against but her. But she took actually me never came on the show. Yes, she never came on the show. So I. I <laughs> I'm glad you were able to make it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, okay, so if you're watching tonight and you won the, best, the gift basket two years ago, you we'll, should we'll still call. have you come We will on still honor that. Right. Yes, right. we will still honor that. So what is our cream de cream tonight? All right, the, the last one up is the Gewurztraminer. So this I is, can't even pronounce it, so this it's is... It's another this German varietal that they just also happen to grow in Alsace. And remember, you know, there's such a strong German influence there. That's, that's why they do this. Uh, but these are also have the, the reputation of being very sweet wines. It's got the biggest bouquet of the evening. Mm -hmm. I could smell it even before it, it, I'm turning the glass to my lips. I'm gonna let you go first, S. This would not be my first choice. Okay. <laughs> it just wouldn't. It just, I think that the sweetness is. You know, even though it's the sweetest wine of the evening, it is still beautifully subtle. Yeah. It is so smooth. It, it really is. I, I, I'm really amazed at how good these guys are with their whites. Th these are all high quality wines, and I, I have not been disappointed by any of them. And Essie, okay. I know what you're saying that this being on the sweeter mm -hmm. side, this might be something for someone like yourself who will have as a dessert wine mm -hmm. afterwards. But for something like, like myself, even though I tend not to like sweet wines, this is really, really good. A perfect way to end the meal. And you get you get so much flavor with this. You get some passion fruit, you get some pineapple, you get some mango. You do get a range of about three or four yeah. different fruits that are circulating there. There's there's a lot going on with this wine. It's it's not a simple white wine for it's it's got some complexity to it, and that's what I love about it. Now I see you might have still noticed. tasting it. it oh yeah, this yeah. are coming out yes. after, and that's that's interesting. And uh, you know we do this all the time mm. on the show about the legs. Mm. Actually, this doesn't have much legs either, but this is one of those wines mm. that sort of does linger in your mm -hmm. mouth afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And you also yeah. notice, uh, and Jim, uh, Essie, that these wines have warmed up a little bit mm -hmm. since we've set mm -hmm. up film. They are still delicious at this temperature. Yeah. They do not have to be yeah. ice cold to enjoy these wines. Actually, I think this one actually tastes better at room temperature almost. I, you know what? I like it at room temperature too. I, I like them cold. I like them at room temperature. Either, and sometimes when you get a sweeter wine too hot it doesn't taste good but this one's doing quite well now a lot of the wines that you brought out tonight I know you've tasted a lot more from this vineyard mm -hmm. um, you just recently were at a tasting where these are these were yes correct? yeah they you know they make a, a sparkling rosé which uh, it was really good my wife and I drank that one before <laughs> I got to the show tonight so you like rosés I love rosés <laughs> thank you Jim I and love I've been pushing that for years <gasps> oh oh I have something for you I'll bring it you got to try it. Okay. Is it <laughs> French? Yes. <laughs> uh, something else I wanted to talk about with the Gewurztraminer is the fact that this pairs really well with spicy dishes. So if, if you, do you eat a lot of Indian yes. food uh, or Thai. Thai food? Thai food. Yeah. This Love. is a great Thai. pairing. Yes. And I, I think. You know, you're right. If you, don't, yeah, if you don't like drinking this by itself, try it with some food. Try it yep. with something spicy. That's a good option. Try it with yep. a curry yep. dish. Yep. Um, you know, crawfish would yep. work well with this. I just tried it with a little bit of a spicy piece of pepperoni. And it really tempered, it really tempered the sweetness of the wine mm -hmm. right down. Um, and Jim is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. If you do like spicy Thai food or any type of spicy food, this would probably be fantastic. Yeah, my go-to uh, has always been the Jacob's Creek Riesling mm -hmm. when, if, when I have Thai food. But yeah, this is an, another mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. substitute there. You know, this would fill in perfectly. You know, and sometimes your tongue gets just a little bit on fire and you want to cool it down. Yeah. So if you chill this a little bit more than we have it chilled right now, Jim, I have on. another, you did not probably know that moment here on the show. Do you know how many bottles were produced in the Alsace region in 2006? That's the no. latest uh, information <laughs> I, I have no find. idea. 138 million wow. bottles. Just from Alsace. Just from wow. Alsace region. Isn't that amazing? That is a, that is a mind-blowing number. On 37,800 acres, I think, is the yeah. total uh, vineyard growth in the Alsace region. That's pretty amazing. I'm not sure what the California statistic is, but you know they're not competing with California. Uh, but phenomenal. Yeah, and keep in mind when they're when they harvest the grapes, they're throwing a lot of them out too. They they don't take everything off the vine. Uh, you know, throughout the entire growing season, they're they're culling so that the 
juices will concentrate within whatever is remaining and give you a lot more flavor from the grape. So, you know, you, you say that it's 138 million bottles. If they didn't do any of this quality control and, and cut any of these grapes away, yeah, they could double that easily. Now, because Jim and I have been on the quest for the most obscure, weird cookie ever since the Girl Scout cookie, oh, yes. I have decided <laughs> to extend that show <laughs> to a cookie which I think is so obscure and so weird that it might actually go with what we're drinking tonight. It, it is, is this the show that never ends? The Girl Scout is, cookie show? No, <laughs> it doesn't end because I'm fascinated by pairing a cookie with wine. So what we have here, and uh, don't try this at home, kids, is a bacon maple cookie. So you're getting the fattiness of the bacon, real maple syrup in the cream, and a dry cookie. So you guys, we're all going to try a okay. cookie. <laughs> I've got to say, my town clerk staff introduced me to these. I haven't tried them yet, though, and they are saying they're incredible. So I'm going to taste it tonight. We're going to taste right. it with the bubbles really quick. I know we only have a few minutes left in the show. I have a feeling this is going to be a regular feature on the show now. We'll just end mm. with a cookie pairing. That bacon comes right out. <laughs> Surprisingly good. But does it go? Mm -hmm. It does go. Not what like it did last show. doesn't go with this, really? <laughs> What doesn't go with this? If you oh, yeah. If you recall last month, I had the uh, trefoils, mm -hmm. the shortbread cookie. That was a disaster. Well, the, the trefoils should be paired with some something bubbly or a Chardonnay. Well, I was misled. Or a Riesling. I was misled. I think we tried. I don't you know tried a red. A red. And, yeah. yeah and that didn't I, I work. was bamboozled. And, uh, that didn't work. But I, yes. I'm still recovering mentally from that. But this is, <laughs> this is delicious. The it's cookie gets so good. salty as soon as you try the wine with it. There's that salt component of the cookie that you don't taste initially. And then when the wine hits your mouth, that saltiness just comes forward. Well, you know, Jim, it's not just a, it, this is another interesting point that you made because we're drinking sparkling. Remember the popcorn with the salt? Mm -hmm. I never got that when we tried it. This works, though. I think the salt of the bacon in this cookie is really the key as to what makes it work with a sparkling. No. And I think that would work, this particular cookie would work with any sparkling because of the salt. I agree. Salt. Really good. Really good. So I, I'm redeemed. So. You've heard it from Bobby P. You've heard it from Jim Tukas. Like, <laughs> the bacon maple cookie works. So in our remaining two minutes, what is going on, Jim? Well, I'm off to France next month. Okay. So hopefully I'll have some stories to share for you from the Champagne region or the Loire Valley. Mm, that, that would be great. And be fun. You've been to Monaco, I believe, right? You've yes, been, you I've spent been some Monaco. time in France. Yes, yes. Was that an interesting trip? Huh? It was a fascinating trip, yes. Um, you drove, I believe, right? Uh, I... Uh, Drove from Italy to Monaco and went to Ez. Ez, if you ever get that opportunity, go to Ez. It's a fascinating. Were you drinking wine trip. at that time also? Every day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a requirement when you go there. Actually, it probably is. I mean, I, I think it's just even in Italy though. When in, you know what? It's beautiful. It's all beautiful. So I hope you have a wonderful trip. Thank you. And Jim, you're you're going to be near Paris, I believe, right? Yeah, and, just uh, outside Paris. So we'll, I'll be spending a lot of time in Paris and then doing a little traveling to some vineyards. And uh, obviously, you might be going to the Champagne region. So. Yep, we'll be right near Champagne. If so any we'll be... packages want to show up on my house or doorstep <laughs> while you're gone because you need to ship something back home, I'll be glad to sign for you. I can make that happen. <laughs> Whether or not they're all going to be there when you get back home and open it up, we'll, we'll see how that happens. But Essie, I want to thank you for being on the oh, show. I'm you. so glad thank you, you won. Thank yes. you. Thank our you for bidding on our I'm basket. delighted. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that I'm going to see you, I guess, at the Mayor's Ball yes. in May when this show is airing. Jim, I'm sorry you're not going to be here, with, but I will be representing. I yes. will be representing. And uh, have a great trip in France. And I will. I'm looking forward to hearing some stories. So thanks for joining us, guys. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, viva la France. Keep us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.